Hello, Professor Treverton. Welcome to this episode of Today on Wall Street. Uh, Professor Treverton, you served as chairman of the National Intelligence Council and directed uh, the RAND Center for Global Risks and Security. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about the intelligence community view uh, on the threat of pandemics. And looking back, why did we fail to prepare for and respond to a pandemic like COVID-19 when it first struck the United States last year? That's a big and very good question. Uh, certainly, uh, pandemics and health issues have, have been significant issues, particularly for the National Intelligence Council, perhaps not so much for intelligence more generally. But certainly, we've been uh, concerned about pandemics in a strategic sense for a very long time. Uh, my predecessors at the National Intelligence Council did global trends, which comes out every four years looking into the future. The one they did in the early 2000s had a scenario for a pandemic that is exactly what happened. They were looking out to 2020. They didn't say it was going to happen in 2020, but they certainly uh, had a scenario that was exactly what has happened to us and the world uh, <clears throat> in the last year or so. Uh, when I was chairing the Global Risk and Security Center at the Rand Corporation, my chairman was Harold Brown, the former defense secretary. And we did in the early 2000s an exercise uh, sort of ranking threats to the United States as existential, serious, or nuisance. Uh, in 2004 or so, we put terrorism, this wouldn't have been what politics did, but we put terrorism in the nuisance category. The only thing in the existential category was a pandemic. Now, I suppose we would add climate change to that list, but uh, this was in 2004. So it's been on the minds of intelligence and lots of other people strategically. Uh, what I think happened is we didn't translate that strategic warning into tactical warning. Uh, partly it was that the Chinese government was covering up, as we now know, and so we didn't get as much information as we needed. But even once we had uh, the information, we were for a combination of reasons that uh, we could spend a long time uh, talking about. Uh, didn't do very well. We had no leadership from the top. That was the most important thing with a president that denied this was happening, thought it was going to be over quickly. We now know he knew better. He just didn't say any better. Uh, and in some ways, the relations between our major health organizations, <coughs> CDC and FDA, look a little bit like the relations between CIA and FBI before 9-11. Uh, there were some gaps, and I think we were a little bit overconfident We'd been through this before. We'd had the good fortune, in some sense, good fortune, to uh, um, have rehearsals on two SARS and H1N1, one of which wasn't very contagious and the other of which wasn't very lethal. But it seems to me we should have known the moment something was happening in Wuhan, it was going to happen here. That's the nature of globalized society. And we should have at least been prepared for the idea that this one might be uh, not both pretty contagious and pretty lethal, which is what we got. So in fact, I think in some sense, our, our lack of acting quickly is in some sense about the greatest government failure, certainly in my lifetime, in terms of needless loss of lives. Uh, we, we could have cut that total dramatically had we acted quickly and much more effectively. I see. So I remember um, in 2019, uh, you and co-authors uh, published a, a year-long study which sort of analyzed the impact of numerous long-term trends in the United States government workforce over a period of two decades. And that study concluded that the overall institutional and workforce trends in the United States had reached a point where critical government op operations might fail in stressful events that were likely to occur. I wonder why or how did you come to that conclusion? Well, we come to the conclusion really by uh, looking at uh, lots of secondary sources, but also a very interesting set of focus groups we ran with senior officials and recent senior officials. And the results of those, and we looked obviously at lots of data, we looked at the increasing polarization uh, in the country, that those are the backdrops for trying to think about the role of the federal government, the federal workforce. But the focus groups were pretty dramatic. Um, they portrayed workplaces that were pretty toxic, where uh, complaint lines got to be weaponized, used as weapons, not as ways to uh, 
cite complaints. Uh, the, <clears throat> the situation for women was especially toxic, we found. And we found that something had been going on for a very long time had gotten very had gotten worse. And that is, there's always been in our system a tension between the political appointees and the permanent government. I remember <clears throat> when I was a young NSC staffer in the Carter administration many long years ago, I was a political appointee, came in, and I didn't really trust the people that were there already, because after all, they worked for the previous folks. Indeed, uh, one of the secretaries in the front office in the West Wing actually had still had a dole sticker on her car, so we knew her politics. Um, but after about a day then, we realized that we couldn't, nothing could happen if we didn't rely on them. We might change the process, but we had to use theirs at the beginning and rely on them. And by about the third day, we realized that these people were, um, didn't work for any particular administration. They worked for the nation and they were loyal to the country. Um, but that's changed. I, I think that the toxicity between the politicals and the permanent government has gotten really, really pretty toxic. Uh, and that's that's a big impediment. I don't think we saw we saw some of that in the uh, failed response to COVID, where we had the president in particular sort of regularly dissing the government's best experts, including Dr. Fauci. Um, so there was some of that there as well. Instead of just sitting back and saying, "Okay, we're going to listen to and rely on the scientists," uh, we had the uh, political people, many of them with no experience at all, uh, pretending like they could be part of the action. Gotcha. Uh, speaking of the intersection between pandemic and intelligence operation, as you know, uh, President Biden ordered a 90-day operation for the intelligence community to find answers to the origin of the of the virus that caused COVID-19, and saying that you know U.S. intelligence agencies are are pursuing rival theories, basically, and potentially includes the possibility of a lab accident from China. So from the intelligence point of view, I wonder, based on the evidence you've seen so far, how would you assess the relative you know, probability of the natural origin theory versus the lab leak theory? Well, probably in the end, we'll, we'll never be sure exactly what happened. It would help if we did, because then we could design measures for the next time around. Uh, the role of intelligence in this is basically, it seems to me, to be a a second and neutral and trained set of eyes. It's not as though intelligence is going to develop new sources at this point. It'll be dependent on the things we've learned from China and in the WHO investigations. So it won't be a matter of, I think, of turning up new information, though it might be interesting. There might be things we find that, I mean, for instance, if we had satellite uh, photos of uh, parking lots at Wuhan hospitals in September, October, that might be interesting. I doubt that we do, but uh, so there may be a few things like that that come up, but mostly it's a matter of getting trained professionals whose business it is to try and come up with explanations and ideally predictions uh, to look at the data that's out there. Um, what's striking to me is the, um, the, the lab leak hypothesis seems to me to have become much more powerful with the passage of time, uh, mostly because the, the, the natural spread doesn't really stand up. Uh, if, if it were, for one thing, we've not found any intermediate animal, animal between bats and humans. So if it is direct bat to human contact, that would suggest a much more dispersed, since the bats are nowhere near Wuhan, uh, that would suggest a much more dispersed uh, pattern of, of infection. Uh, and second, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I'm told that if this had occurred naturally, probably it wouldn't have emerged as so lethal as it did. So in some ways, what's happened is not so much that the new, new evidence has supported the lab leak hypothesis, but it's that the natural, the natural spread from animals to humans has been, it seems to be, more and more discredited. So I think the uh, this, this assessment is, is welcome, probably isn't going to settle the case definitively, but it's, it's certainly the right thing to do in these circumstances. And I think it's a, it's a shame that um, China hasn't been much more forthcoming. They've really done themselves no good uh, by hiding, pretending, uh, in some sense, completely open 
And this would have, I think, served everybody and certainly served the world because this is going to happen again, we know. And uh, therefore, getting this one right would, would, would be uh, really important. Gotcha. And as you know, um, the WHO top emergency expert, I think last week said that, you know, the search for the origin of the coronavirus was being poisoned by politics. I think from, from both sides a little bit, especially with the previous administration, which really brings up the question of US-China rivalry. Um, so you published a uh, opinion piece in The Hill in which you argue that Xi Jinping's China is not China forever and America's policy should be driven by what's good for the United States, not what might be bad for China. So that's an interesting statement. Can you please unpack that sentence a little bit for me? Um, what aspects of the current US-China competition debate do you think are misguided? Sure, happy to. I know I've been dismayed, more and more dismayed by the, the kind of debate uh, in the United States and Washington, particularly about China. It's uh, it's sort of from right to left. It's not a partisan thing anymore. It's become from kind of from right to left across the spectrum, uh, in a sense that uh, China is uh, is seeking superiority, is trying to not just achieve its place in the sun, but uh, that almost everything China does is strategic and bad for the United States. Uh, and that just seems to me to be a very unhelpful perspective. <clears throat> My starting point is, sure, there are lots of things that China is doing that we don't like, uh, and some of them we need to counter. So patrols in the South China, South China, South China Sea will continue to be important just to, to, to make the point that this is not uh, a Chinese lake, but it's open international waterways. Um, but other things they're doing, like much of what they've done in Africa, seems to me somewhere between a waste of money and maybe doing some good works. Uh, so those are things that seem to me that we ought to either applaud or simply recognize China's going to do. And then at the other extreme, there are things we absolutely need to do together. If the human race is going to survive, China and the United States have to work together on climate change. There's just, it's an imperative. So for me, the point is really to to begin to unpack this and not turn everything into a threat. Say, let's let's do something that the US government is not very good at doing. That's walking and chewing gum at the same time, right? But that needs to happen in the China case. We need to uh, keep things in different categories and hope that we can insulate the places where we need to cooperate uh, from the places where we are going to have different interests and are going to take actions that, that can conflict with, with each other um, but that having a framework, it seems to me, that recognizes that this has both elements of conflict, but also elements of, of cooperation is critical. And the backdrop is that, I mean, people keep referring to this as a, as a new Cold War. And I think that's, again, a very bad analogy, uh, mainly because during the Cold War, we had almost no economic interests shared with the Soviet Union and its allies. This case, not so. The United States and China are intimately connected economically in important ways that are good for us both. And so um, recognizing that as the backdrop and then trying to, to, um, to keep alive possibilities for cooperation where we'd like to, even as we have some conflictual elements, uh, that I think is the, the challenge in front of us. And sort of easy slogans about um, Cold War and things like that, I think, are not very helpful in that conversation. I see, I see. And now when we talk about U.S.-China competition, a lot of interest really is on China's paramount leader, Xi Jinping. Um, in your opinion piece, you also discuss issues related to China's leadership succession, which now is sort of in flux. Um, so how would you compare Xi Jinping with his predecessors in terms of their approach to governance based on your observations? These are observations from a distance, and I'm not a deep uh, sinologist. Uh, but it is impressive, as everybody's noted, that he has centralized leadership in China in a way we hadn't really seen since Mao. Uh, and in some ways, I always think that, that leaders depend on personality plus circumstance. And so the circumstances he inherited uh, presumably did make for a certain centralization or made that make sense. But he certainly carried that to a, to a huge extreme, it seems to me, and and Part of the problem on the Chinese side, apparently, in the COVID episode was that people beneath him were reluctant to share bad news upward, which is a characteristic of authoritarian systems, to be sure. Uh, 
Um, so that that style is very different, and it seems to me it's 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 not serving uh, China well in current circumstances. Um, it seems like in some cases China's foreign policy, a little bit like Mr. Trump, tends to uh, substitute a temper tantrum for a reasoned policy, and I think that's not good for China, not good for U.S.-China relations. Uh, what I want to point out in the article is just how different uh, leaders have been from Mao Zedong to Deng Xiaoping to Xi Jinping, you know, they're very different kinds of leaders. And, and partly that is, I suppose, elicited by the circumstances in which they find themselves. Uh, and I was speculating in the piece a bit, we don't know how long Mr. Xi will be there. He seems to want to stay essentially forever. Um, but my guess is the longer he stays and the messier the transition is, uh, I would have thought at this point, some collective leadership would have been some protection, but he's abandoned that. Uh, and so the next time around, his successor, whenever that happens, is going to face a, a different set of, quite different set of circumstances. And that, as I speculate in the piece, could make for a, a leader whose style and operations are quite different uh, from Xi's. I see, I see. So in, in the article, you also mentioned made this uh, interesting point that China is not just a monolithic uh, Communist Party sitting in Beijing helping on imposing its, its ideology and development model around the world. So what are some of the more complex realities about China that the current debates on China policy don't seem to emphasize enough? It was really kind of speculation on my part. It's always uh, seemed to me uh, for a long time that we tended to focus much too much on Beijing, just as often uh, people look at the United States focus much too much on Washington, right? That the United States is uh, not Washington and China is not Beijing. So it seemed to me for a long time that that uh, a China that was less Beijing and more uh, Hong Kong, Shanghai particularly, and in one sense one day uh, Taipei, would be a very different kind of China. It might be uh, even more effective economically, but it would be, it seems to me, a quite different China. And some of the work by uh, authors like Chung Li on the middle class, have, it seems to me, opened an interesting line of at least thinking. It is quite speculative, but imagining that what a, a middle class Shanghai China would look like would be quite different uh, from uh, a governmental Beijing, uh, China, and uh, uh, where there could be in the arts and architecture and other things, lots of points of contact and have been in the past between the United States and China. And those might be in a, in a more people to people sense, things we could build on. And since there now is uh, such a interaction of people, particularly Chinese and Chinese uh, students coming to the United States, that seems to me to be a, 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 an important basis for beginning to think not today or tomorrow. She's eagerness for a place in the sun is going to continue. And maybe his haste is, is also based on partly on the recognition that time is not exactly on China's side in the sense that it's getting older while it's still quite poor. Uh, so economically, there's a, a certain deadline or at least urgency about it. But over the long run, longer run of these, this different, wider kind of China that's less focused on Beijing uh, might be a, a one in which we could have fruitful relations, particularly at the at the people to people uh, level. Uh, anyway, that's the <clears throat> that's kind of my hope. And uh, but it's it's always seemed to me that we tended to focus uh, too much on uh, the party and Beijing, and not enough on what's going on in the rest of China, particularly perhaps in Shanghai. I see, I see. So in terms of concrete policy proposals, what do you think are the elements of a more realistic and comprehensive U.S.-China policy? Well, I think the elements are, are mostly ones that the Biden administration is beginning to put together. Um, I mean, the, the right way to Mr. Trump's tariffs got China's attention, but then he didn't do any follow-up. The thing he needed to do is what Mr. Biden is doing, and that is, putting together a coalition of like-minded states that also have their uh, grievances against China over intellectual property and the set of issues that's been in contention. So the right way to do this is to, uh, it seems to me, to organize that coalition and then try and work with China through that coalition. 
there's been a little bit of a sense in the Quad and other things of putting together a kind of block to oppose China. I think that's not so bad tactically, but probably unwise strategically in the long run. I would rather see the, the coalitions built on common interests around particular issues, not in a way sort of to confront China. The other thing that, uh, <clears throat> a big thing that uh, Mr. Biden set in motion is, again, things I call in the article, things we should do for ourselves, never mind whether China existed or not. And so those things like beginning to uh, rebuild infrastructure, to dramatically expand the government support for basic R&D, those are things that uh, we should be doing in any case. And uh, I suppose there's nothing wrong with, um, with Mr. Biden selling them as a, a way to compete with China. But I do worry that if you, if you do that, then you sort of open the door to those people out there who uh, don't really want to build infrastructure, but do want to um, complain about and be tough on China. So I think there are limits to that tactic. But beginning to do the things that we should do in our own interest, um, reacting to the things we need to, like the South China Sea, uh, but not making a bigger deal of it than it has to be. And then also at the same time, trying to pursue uh, cooperative ventures, particularly on health and climate, but also recognizing that, uh, you know, China is, when China does good through the BRI or other things, we ought to recognize that those are good things, not bad things, and not look at uh, every loan, which incidentally, many are not gonna get repaid, but not look at them as a, as a debt trap, but uh, look at them as maybe doing some, some good along the way. Gotcha. Thank you so much for the insights. It's such a helpful conversation. Thank you, uh, Professor Trefferton. I look forward to talking with you in the future when opportunities arise. Great. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Have a good rest of the day. Okay. All the best mm -hmm. to you. Bye-bye.